This morning, we are going to hear from Lee Schofield, uh, who uh, is the RSPB's man at Horswater, has been for 10 years, Lee? How long have you been there? Nine, nine and nine a bit years. years. Yeah. Nine years. And he's written a fantastic book, which I've read, which I've got here, which hopefully my blurry bit won't completely destroy. But I think we've got an image of it coming up. It's called Wild Fell. Uh, it came out, I think, in February of this year. Um, and it's all about the work that Lee's been doing. Uh, uh, thank you, Derek, um, in that part of the world. And I'll let Lee talk about what he's done and what he's doing and how it's come across and how it's been for him. But it's a really interesting book. And I think Lee is a fascinating person to have in our county. Uh, and I just wondered, I, I, I went on a walk with Lee um, in his part of the world last year, last summer. And um, I thought then when he told me he's got a book coming out, that could make a really interesting session on this call. Because I just wonder whether there's parallels between some of the work he's doing and the cultural offer and, you know, the, the tensions that that creates sometimes in the county. So we're looking forward to hearing from Lee, which we'll hear from shortly. He's got some beautiful slides. And then Ben Heslop, um, who has been on this call once before, about six months ago, perhaps a bit longer than that, who's an amazing entrepreneurial artist and cultural leader in Carlisle. Um, the street art that is emerging in Carlisle and has been over the last few years is astonishing and really vibrant. And Ben is pulling together a festival Take, to take place at Tribe and Bits Park towards the end of this month. And so we've got three really nice little films to watch of what's going on there. And Ben will explain more about that as well. So that's something to really look forward to as well. Um, so we're going from, you know, Golden Eagles to street art this morning. Uh, that's not a bad cross section of what's going on in Cumbria at the moment. So without further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Lee. And Lee, I've got your presentation, so I will dig that up and share my screen. And uh, the floor is yours. Lovely, thanks. Um, before I forget, uh, Ben, we've got a, a, a brilliant opportunity for some street art to decorate our um, new tree nursery that we put in. We've got a great big barn uh, with a blank wall that just needs something vibrant and, and exciting. So I'll, I'll pick that up with you afterwards, perhaps, to see if there's any way that we might be able to work together. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, thanks very much for having me. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick kind of um, virtual tour of Horsewater, the, the, the land that I'm uh, incredibly lucky to, to help look after. Um, uh, and then, yeah, just a little bit about uh, why I decided that writing a book about my experiences was something that was that was worth doing. So um, yeah, next slide, please, Tom. So the ground that we've got at Horsewater is, is pretty extensive. So we're looking after about a third of the 10,000 hectare catchment around Horsewater Reservoir, all of which is owned by United Utilities. So um, as we talked about Sarah's um, book, which described the, the, the creation of the reservoir and the, the flooding of the, the small settlements that were now that now lie underneath the water. Um, obviously a kind of quite well-known story, quite um, kind of quite melancholy. Um, one that changed the, the character of the, the, the valley really significantly. So Horsewater itself is, is the most important reservoir in northwest England, provides two million people with their drinking water every day. Um, and the, the 10,000 hectares of land around it um, are, you know, really quite dramatic. Some of the some of the most sort of dramatic fells in the Lake District, I think the, the fact that there aren't those um, field patterns, there aren't the settlements within the valley, gives the area a really kind of quite distinctive, sort of quite wild and, and, and lonely feeling. Um, so the land that we're looking after covers two farms, Naddle Farm and Swindale, which together add up to about 750 hectares, but associated with those are some big chunks of common land as well. Um, so we're, yeah, we're looking after roughly 3,000 hectares of land altogether, which is about 1% of the Lake District National Park. Um, the reason for us taking on those farms was as an organisation really to kind of learn more about hill farming initially to understand the economics, the opportunities for ecological restoration within a, a sort of in, in inverted commas sort of traditional farming setup. And the idea was that we would sort of gain that understanding, we would try different things and then we would sort of share those different things with others in the hope of sort of inspiring change more widely. So the focus for us is not just on wildlife and not just on birds. You know, the RSPB is actually much more about, you know, habitats 
um, the sort of the function of the ecosystem rather than just just on birds themselves, as as is kind of generally perceived. But we're also focusing on um, you know the management of land to improve the quality of the water, um, and that's that's the kind of the basis of the partnership that we have with United Utilities. So we are their farming tenants on those two farms, Nadland Swindell, but we're also working to a, a sort of a shared a shared management plan which delivers for for improved water and for improved wildlife as well. And our hope is that we can try to find a way that, that finds a, a sort of a balance between hill farming and ecological restoration, um, because, you know, obviously hill farming has all these strong cultural associations in the Lake District. It's not about to just kind of disappear anytime soon, I don't think. So trying to show how you can have um, an element of livestock production, retain some of that kind of cultural heritage at the same time as, you know, improving the land's potential to lock up more carbon, to reduce flood risk and, and provide better habitats for wildlife. So we still have this farming operation. We still have about 300 breeding ewes. Um, we've got a small herd of belted Galloway and Highland cows, um, and we use a few fell ponies for conservation grazing as well. So yeah, just give you a bit of a, a virtual tour with some, with some photos. Go to the next one, please, Tom. So the sort of real jewel in the crown of the land that we're looking after are the woodlands. So um, for those of you who've, who've been to Horsewater, you'll remember that there's uh, this amazing sort of tunnel of, of ancient forest that you drive through for the first sort of half of the reservoir um, heading down towards the car park at Mardell Head. Um, those woodlands are, uh, you know, a, a, a significant chunk of, of temperate rainforest, probably one of the, you know, one of the most important bits of that habitat in the Lake District after Borrowdale. Lots of big old craggy trees, amazing mosses and lichens and supporting a whole range of species, so pride flycatchers and red starts and wood warbler, um, as well as uh, what we refer to in the RSPB as non-birds, uh, things like red squirrels. Um, there's some really important patches of juniper scrub as well, really sort of uh, some really ancient juniper scrub covering around 15 hectares and then and then lots of younger um, juniper scrub that we've, we've sort of been planting up over the course of the years. Um, and these are, you know, tremendously rich habitats, but they are quite restricted, you know, they, they occupy a couple of hundred hectares um, across the, the area that we're looking after. Um, but, you know, historically, they would have been much more widespread. So wherever you see bracken, that's basically telling you where trees used to be. So a big focus on our work is, is kind of expanding those woodlands back out into the wider landscape in order to provide all of those benefits that, that trees give us the, you know, the carbon sequestration and the, the wildlife improvement. Um, next slide, please. Most of the site, however, looks more like this. Um, so pretty typical, um, you know, open montane landscapes uh, dominated by species poor acid grassland as a result of hundreds and hundreds of years of, of heavy grazing, particularly heavy over the course of the last 70 years since the, um, you know, since the Second World War and the development of subsidies that, that intensified farming, which is what did sort of so much damage across the whole of the UK. Um, but, you know, high altitude, very brittle landscapes like we have in the Lake District suffered probably disproportionately and take a much longer period of time to recover. Um, so species like mountain ringlet butterfly, um, wheat ear there, um, you know, mount, uh, uh, skylarks and, and meadow pipits, you know, the, the sort of the typical upland birds that you see in the Lake District are, are you know, they, they cover large areas of our land at Horswater. Um, and what we're trying to do, as I said, is, is, is sort of transition those habitats into something richer and, and, and more diverse over time. So the picture in the bottom left there is a small tarn that we restored. So a big part of what we do is, is sort of read the clues in the landscape, like the bracken that shows us where the woodland used to be. You can quite often find sort of ghost water bodies that appear on the maps up until about 1950, and then drainage work came in and, and, and took them away again. So, so slowly, slowly, we are kind of undoing a lot of that, that damage and restoring some of these features back to the landscape. And that, that small tarn in the bottom left there um, was brought back to life very easily just by, by blocking up the drain that had been cut to take the water away from it. Um, and now it's a you know, fantastic, rich, little bit of habitat in the, in the landscape supporting you know, lots of emergent plants, bog bean and, and tall sedges and rushes and things, and lots of, lots of invertebrates feeding over it during the summer months. Okay, next slide, please. 
one of the most important fragments and one that's quite a big focus for, for um, the book um, is the alpine plants that are growing on some of our crags. So once you get away from the terrain that the sheep and the deer can reach on Harterfell and on the crags around Bleewater are these just, just absolutely jaw dropping um, communities of plants that, that have just managed to cling on because they haven't been grazed. They are, they're, they're sort of effectively pristine habitats. They, they've suffered a little bit from um, Victorian plant collecting, who, who, which will have sort of robbed some of the sort of choiciest, rarest plants, particularly the ferns. There was a real craze for fern collecting during the Victorian period. But beyond that, these 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 ledges and cliffs have been allowed just to kind of get on with their own thing, um, and they are full of of big, bulky, really attractive herbs that are you know visually appealing to us, but very tasty to a whole range of different invertebrates. And a big focus of, of, of the book and of our work at Horsewater is about trying to allow these plant communities to expand back out into the wider landscape again, which is where they really belong. They don't want to be just growing on these tall herbs and uh, on these tall cliffs and ledges. The picture in the top left um, is a species called pyramidal bugle. And this is the sort of most extreme example of the, the fragmented and vulnerable state that, that nature has found itself in in the Lake District. Pyramidal bugle grows in just one location in the whole of England, just over the watershed from Horsewater. Um, there are about 40 plants and that's it for the whole of England. So if there were to be a rock fall where that small colony is growing, that would be that would be it, that it would be wiped out. So we're working with some of these really rare species, collecting their seeds, growing them on and, and putting them back out into the wider landscape to sort of bolster them and give them, hopefully give them a more secure future. Next slide, please. So the Valley of Swindale um, is uh, sort of where the interventions that we've made are sort of the most conspicuous. So how we're trying to promote change is, is, is through changes to grazing largely across the wider landscape. And that takes a long time. You know, it takes a long time for vegetation to reestablish itself or for trees to, to, to re-emerge from some of those swords. In Swindale, we've done some sort of physical interventions, which are um, uh, much easier to see. So we've re-meandered about a kilometre of the Swindale Beck, putting the historic bends back into it. We've changed the grazing um, and the way the hay meadows are managed so that they're, they're um, increasingly uh, sort of diverse and, and rich now. Um, and we've also planted lots of trees and done a whole range of different things. So we, we tend to talk about Swindale the most because it's, it's where all those different interventions are the most, the most visible. Um, it's a fantastic hidden gem of a place, Swindale. Um, and you know, one of the things that we're quite lucky in, in Horsewater is that we don't have the sort of the visitor pressure that some of the rest of the Lake District does. And we're, we, you know, we quite like to keep it that way. So one of the things I'm quite nervous about is having written this book, hoping that we're not suddenly going to get swamped with uh, lots of people coming to, coming to visit us because the, 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 the quiet and the, the lack of disturbance is one of the things that does keep it really quite special. Um, next slide. And yeah, so this is just an image showing the um, the, the, the re-meandering work. So in the bottom left there, the sort of the straight line that runs through the middle of the valley is the old Beck, and the wiggly one is the new course as it was being constructed. Um, the old one has since been filled in and is, is sort of starting to disappear now. Um, and the really exciting thing was that once those bends were back in the Beck, um, salmon returned to spawn almost immediately within about um, three months of the machines leaving, salmon were back in there. So a really powerful example of how if you create the right conditions, nature can respond and can and can do so incredibly quickly. Next slide. So um, we utilize sort of a whole range of different techniques to try to communicate change. So although we've got these pockets of really valuable habitat, lots of important species, you know, what we're about is, is landscape change. We're about trying to make our lands richer and wilder and more functional to provide a whole range of different sort of services to people. Um, so, you know, reduce flood risk, more carbon sequestration, all that kind of stuff. But, but change is quite difficult, especially in a place like the Lake District, which is so revered. You know, 20 million visitors come to the Lake District every year. Um, many of them look at it and think it is perfect and that there's nothing wrong with it. And the idea of changing it in any ways is, is considered just, you know, an actual absolute aberration but we you know we need to change these places if we're to do anything to tackle the climate and biodiversity crises that we're we're staring down these places need to change and they need to perform better um 
So we've, we've just had these visualizations um, recently completed for us. And this shows the sort of the before picture, which is, um, you know, uh, a landscape which has got these pockets of, of rich habitat in it, but large swathes that have been heavily impacted by grazing, both by too many sheep, but also by too many deer. Um, and yeah, lots of detail kind of in there, the straightened river, um, the farming operation using black plastic silage bales, all that kind of stuff. And the next slide um, shows what we're aiming for. So um, if you could click onto it, it should fade in. So it's still recognizably the same sort of rugged, attractive Lake District landscape. Um, but the difference is that, you know, there's more trees, there's more structure, there's more flowers, there's more pollen for the invertebrates and, and more food for a, for a wider range of different bird species and, and other wildlife. Um, next slide, please. So we've done a series of sort of vignettes as well that show the sort of transition. So this is the, the Swindale one, um, showing the sort of the move from a from a straight canalised channel to uh, one with 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 all the meanders back in. And, and again, sort of lots of very realistic detail. You know, obviously it's an artistic rendering, but you know the fact that the salmon are there. We're working on a water vole reintroduction, which is a there's a little water vole swimming in the front right there. The change in the plant community has gone from you know from the left to the right. Um, and these these are really powerful and really helpful and they're not you know they're not unrealistic these are pretty accurate renderings of things that we're already seeing happening and just sort of casting casting our minds forward a little bit next one same thing for the bog so blocking up the drains in the in the in the moorland in the peatland to bring the water back up to the surface again in order to help those areas slow the flow of water and retain more carbon in their soils rather than releasing it into the atmosphere next one Likewise, the crags releasing those those wonderful kind of alpine plant communities from their ledges out into the wider landscape again, and all the benefits that will have for, for invertebrates and for birds. And next one. And so telling that story of change, which is is really kind of why I, I went about writing the book, you know, there is this there is this fear of change, there is this perception that things are fine as they are. Um, and there is also this resistance to big organizations like the RSPB turning up in a place that has been the sort of the sole preserve of small family farms for generations and, and seemingly kind of imposing that view, um, in, imposing an agenda on others. And actually what I try really hard to do in, in, in Wild Fell is, is make it clear that actually the changes we are making are, are on our own land. You know, yes, we would like to see change more widely, but we're not in a position to impose it on anybody, but actually we would like people to, to see it and to, 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 you know, to maybe take things away from it and, to recognise that um, there are lots and lots of different approaches, you know, even within our land at Horswater, we are doing things which could comfortably be described as rewilding, but we're doing those things alongside, you know, fairly traditional farming, using native breeds, moving livestock around in a very sort of traditional, um, sort of old fashioned shepherding kind of a way. We're making hay in our hay meadows in the way that has been done for hundreds and hundreds of years. And actually, you know, we're finding that those different approaches, they can work quite comfortably alongside each other, even within a single valley. Um, so if we can get to this, if we can get to a point of accepting that actually, you know, what we need is a mosaic of different approaches that will result in a mosaic of different habitats and then a diversity of species, that's much better than the, the sort of the debate around land at the moment, which is often like it's rewilding versus farming. And, and you know, there's nothing in between. The, you know, the truth is that there's actually a, an awful lot of middle ground that lots of us are already occupying um, and, and kind of getting on with really, really good stuff. So um, the sort of the stimulus for me writing the book was um, an accusation from the Lake District's World Heritage Steering Group um, that, that Horswater was perceived as a wart on the face of the Lake District National Park. Um, and, you know, so my book is a kind of a fairly, um, long-winded response to that accusation and, and trying to show that actually, uh, you know, we are just as entitled to, to kind of do what we're doing, just as, just we are just as authentic, just as passionate as, as any, um, you know, any Lake District farmer who might have been here for four generations and just trying to show that actually, you know, we need a diverse range of different actors doing different things in the landscape. And, you know, we are, we are part of that cultural landscape now, whether, whether people like that or not really. Um, yeah, so it's been out for uh, yeah two or three months. It seems to be going down quite well. Don't don't really know. It's kind of out there doing its own thing now. Um, but yeah, hopefully hopefully it's contributing to the debate about the future of of land management in the Lake District and, and hopefully further afield as well. Um, yeah, so that's.
to me. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Lee. What a, what a great, what beautiful images there. Um, and what a beautiful part of the world it is. I, I, I'll come to some questions in chat when I get a second to look at it in a second. Um, just stick your hand up, by the way, if you want to ask something or do that electronically or just so I can see you. Lee, I think February 24th was um, was when it came out. Um, what, what's the reception? What, what sort of reception have you had in the, in the you know, ensuing months from, because obviously you're talking to a Cumbrian audience uh, this morning um, uh, and the, the glamour of Vega being in Derby, um, but she is in Cumbria really. Um, what's it gone like? What's it, how's it gone down sort of, I suppose, locally as well as beyond locally? I mean, I've had some really, I had some really great feedback from lots of people. I've had lots of, lots of farmers that have been really positive about it and sort of a few, the sort of some of the kind of most cherished feedback is people saying, I picked it up intending to kind of rip it to bits and leave a, a terrible review on Amazon and absolutely pan it. And then actually having read it, realised that, that actually it's quite reasonable and that they can recognise that there are kind of more similarities in how we're doing things and, and how lots of farmers are doing things as opposed to it being, you know, completely at, uh, you know, at the total opposite end of a spectrum. So, so I've had a little bit of that. Um, I haven't had a huge amount of negative feedback, to be honest. Um, I think there's a few people a bit concerned that, that maybe it might be kind of driving more footfall than we necessarily want in the area. And if you live in that area, that, that, that might be a concern, but, but yeah, generally the, generally the feedback's been really good so far. So, I mean, it's early days, I think, you know, the, the hardback obviously sells less than the paperback, so it will probably reach more people as the paperback comes out in a year's time. Um, but yeah, I, I think so far, signs are good that it seems to be landing quite well. Okay, well, let's go to Amy next and then Monique. Amy, off you go. Yeah, um, I'm just quite interested in the kind of about the perceptions of farming and especially in a place like Cumbria, but not necessarily to farmers, to, you know, just to the wider general public who kind of, I think, tend to think of farming as something connected with nature, quite a natural thing. And I think in society in general, you know, in this country, we think, oh, farming, that's natural. And because we've done it for thousands and thousands of years. So I suppose I'm just wondering if in the book, it's something you touch on maybe about the perceptions of farming and about what's natural and what isn't kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah, there's quite a bit of that. Um, I mean, I think one of the the thing, one of the problems that we generally make as a, as a sort of society is is that we just refer to farming as one thing, and it isn't just one thing. You know, there are some forms of farming which are absolutely devastating for nature, and there's no way that nature can kind of live within or alongside it. You know, a lot of modern intensive farming falls into that camp, sadly. But then there are more traditional lighter touch models of farming where wildlife can can sort of permeate and and does so um and the, you know what we need to do is not just say farming is all bad um because of course it isn't and of course we all need to eat um but just try to nudge the farming community to towards finding ways that are um you know better better for nature and what's interesting in the uplands is that actually those models of farming which are better for nature are, are often actually also better for for farm businesses you know in very marginal steep wet places like the lake district if you're pouring shed loads of fertilizer onto your ground most of it's just going to get washed away anyway you're going to get very little benefit from that so one of the really interesting ideas around upland farming at the moment is this concept of sort of less is more and that if you farm within the land sort of natural carrying capacity um, that you won't be wasting money on those costly inputs and you'll be providing um, uh, you know out, good outcomes for nature almost by accident so so yeah there's lots of that kind of you know I, what I try to do in the book is, is sort of talk about the kind of nuance rather than just kind of lumping things together and talking about you know farming in the general sense so so yeah, lo lots of that in the book. Thanks, Amy. Monique. Yes, but thanks for that presentation. I think it's a uh, high time to uh, to change the landscape in the Lake District, <laughs> make it make it more attractive for me anyway, and for for wildlife certainly. Um, I don't like all these um, all these um, fells without any trees on them. Um, but I was wondering. Um, if it is decided, uh, hopefully um, soon, that beavers are going to be um, be allowed out of their enclosures, would you uh, consider reintroducing beavers in this in this area? Yeah, absolutely. So th they're already in an enclosed project just down the valley from us at Lauda. Um 
and yeah we we had an application to be to to go in um to do one at the same time at, at Horswater, a much larger one than the one at Lowther. but united utilities who you know we work in partnership with they sort of got a bit nervous about the sort of the potential negative PR um, but they're working in partnership over at Ennerdale looking at a Bieber reintroduction um, so they're actually pretty on board so we're basically just waiting for the announcement as you said um, of the, 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 what the government are going to decide but yes they're, they're very much on the cards you know anything that helps to slow the flow of water and improve the quality of the water which beavers absolutely do we need to be um, we need to be working with so yeah I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll have beavers around Hall's water hopefully in the not too distant future. Well, that'd be great, thank you. Thanks, Monique. I'll come to Derek and then Henry, and then Peter in a second. Joe asks Lee in chat, can you say a bit more about how you're using the visualizations as a public engagement tool and the difference they make? Are they changing minds? Are they getting people involved? Um, yes, yeah, so we, we've, we've got a sort of narrated film um, how, uh, sort of talking through those visualizations, which is out there. And that just becomes a very easy way to communicate to people what it is that we're doing um it's you know it, it that that's publicly accessible um so i mean we do we host lots and lots of visits at Horswater. water um i give quite a lot of talks so it, it is really just there to kind of explain what we're doing what the landscape might look like over time um are they changing minds i don't know the, i mean the feedback is always very positive from them um they uh, uh yeah i think i think they're a very useful tool but yes yeah, quite quite hard to measure sort of how effective they're being i suppose and Joe's works with Art Gene, I know, in, in Barrow with some amazing, the allotment soup there is, is an amazing example of um, education through through getting your hands dirty. It's a lovely thing there. Yeah. Uh, Derek. Derek, did you want to ask a question? You're just on mute at the moment, Derek. Sorry, I thought I'd unmuted myself. So. Um, one thing struck me, Lee, um, you, reading your book was quite what the impact of the Second World War had on the way that the Lake District was seen. Um, and that, that, that time scale very much ties in with what James Rebanks talked about in his book uh, and how he's gone back much more to his grandfather's way of farming than to his father's. Um, you also talk about the um, not entirely beneficial aspect of the World Heritage um, site. And that seems to me to be quite similar in a way to the way that buildings um, are become listed, because they become listed in the form they happen to be at the time, not necessarily in their original form. And it does seem quite an interesting parallel. Did, did, yeah. did you have anything to say about that? Yeah, um, yeah. So James's story is is very similar to mine, really. So I'm quite I'm I'm, I'm quite friendly with James. Um, his kids are at the same school as mine, um, and we yeah we've got to know each other over the last few years. And he described my book as kind of a photo negative of his, in that he's a he's a farmer, basically kind of coming towards conservation. And I'm probably somebody who was who was probably a bit more extreme and sort of rewilding and just thinking we just need to kind of get rid of all this farming and come to recognise actually that how much value the farming has and 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 how there is kind of more new nuance. So. I hope our books sort of complement each other and I've, a lot of the things that he's doing at his place we're doing at ours too um so yeah I, I in terms of the cultural heritage stuff i i sort of I, i'm sort of developing a bit of a concern around the whole concept of cultural heritage this idea that you can fix anything in time particularly a landscape is just a nonsense you know and landscapes the way that land has been managed in the lake district has never been constant you know it is always adapting to the to the changing demands of society you know all that sort of it's easy to call it damage now that was done after the second world war was was for good reason you know it was it was to provide us with food security in case another war should break out you know it was it was misjudged in lots of different ways but the initial the, the sort of the intention behind it was one that was for the good of people and now we recognize that actually probably an over a, a greater need is is to defend ourselves against climate change and to reduce flood risk and all those sorts of things so the same sort of response the same kind of um adapting to those needs is is, is at the heart of all of this stuff but it's just a, a, a constant evolution so this idea that uh, the world heritage site um 
fixed so, so, has kind of said that you know the last 30 years was the the time that we need to kind of preserve and keep going is just it's just ridiculous you know as long as you've got people working in the landscape adapting to those changing needs of society then that's that's what the sort of the world heritage designation should be about i think but that's not really how it's been perceived and how it's been communicated so so yeah i mean i wouldn't i i wouldn't be at all sad if the world heritage site designation was stripped to be honest it's it it actually genuinely does provide a barrier prove a barrier it's easier to do conservation work outside of the national park than it is inside as a result of the the paperwork that has to be done because of the, the world heritage site and you know the people who designed national parks never would have wanted that you know okay um we've got time for three more quick questions and i'd encourage you to be brief if you can gentlemen henry then peter then andrew henry off you go yeah that last point <coughs> sort of informs my question now um I was wanting to ask you, how hopeful are you that the model that you're using around rewilding can be transferred to other parts of Cumbria? And I'm very interested in this middle ground that you're finding there and wondering if you'd be willing to speak to organisations like the Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership, which is looking at uh, all kinds of different ways to get to net zero in, in Cumbria. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to talk. Um, voice. I mean... There, there is, there's just loads of change happening all over. So particularly in the sort of the big landowner kind of sector. Um, so, you know, people like Mark Cropper, people like Jim Lowther, um, quite a few of the big landowners are, you know, all over this stuff. Um, and partly they're all over it because that's the direction that the subsidies are going in. Um, you know, the new um, environmental land management schemes are going to be rewarding landowners, land managers for for the kinds of stuff that we're doing basically um and so they are you know partly it's financially motivated but the ones that i've spoken to they're all actually genuinely invested in it as well and really quite excited at the opportunities of, of of kind of building the health back up of their land because that at the end of the day is their asset you know and for years the 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 quality of that asset is, has been degraded and now they see the opportunity to kind of to, to to build it back up again the bigger challenge is in the sort of the tenant farming sector because there are not that those those subsidies aren't quite as appealing um, to a sort of more productive, um, you know, sort of productively minded farmer um, as they are to those other landowners. So there's, I think, we're going to end up with a sort of um, a sort of a two tone kind of approach to the to the landscape. But yeah, there's a lot happening already. Um, so I think there are some reasons to be optimistic. Yeah. Thank you, Henry. Peter. Uh, yeah, highly. Yeah, there were two two things um, that um, one you've just touched on was to ask how you think the new subsidies and the new uh, is going to affect the farmers and affect the land and what the take up is going to be like on that. And obviously you just touched on that. And the other thing was um, how much has the biodiversity changed since you started doing the project? Have you noticed a great change in the biodiversity there? Yeah, the, the things are definitely changing and, and it seems to be increasingly kind of conspicuous to people that are visiting as well so we've had a few people come through recently that have kind of stopped and chatted with joe who works in our tree nursery and just said you know how come there's more flowers in this part of the world than, than the the, the neighboring estate which is which is pretty gratifying for us i don't really see that because i'm seeing it changing so slowly over time um but you know things like salmon um coming back in the beck restoration that was an immediate um improvement tree pipits um have have sort of which are a red listed bird species are uh, increasing in number in some of the new woodland areas. Um, red grouse have, have started to breed on Mardell Common again after an absence of a very long time because of the, the 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 lighter grazing regime means there's more heather and the red grouse eat the heather. So we confirmed that they were breeding for the first time um, this year. Um, and yeah, the place is just kind of generally becoming sort of more flower rich, more invertebrates. So it is it is starting to happen. But as with anything in the uplands, you know these things take take a long time um, and we've still got big challenges to work through you know we've got far too many deer in the landscape um, and their numbers need to be brought down if we're to see the kind of natural succession of, of, of some of these areas of scrub and woodland that we're after so there's still lots of work to do but yeah there's definitely definitely signs that things are going in the right direction thank you peter and last one to andrew yeah thanks um this is a uh, going coming back to the art um part of our our network and and um i was intrigued when i saw those two images of the before and after 
Um, and they, they instantly reminded me of the sort of images you'd see in a Jehovah's Witness um, publication. Um, and I wonder, that probably sounds more offensive than it's meant to be, but, but um, they, they, because they're, they're representations um, and um, they give you an impression of what might change, but what really changed in that was the, 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 the painting rather than the landscape. And I wonder whether you'd had the opportunity or thought about working with um, digital artists to produce either moving images of the changes um, in, the, in the form of video. I'm thinking in terms of CGI. So you in fact work with photorealistic um, before and after images, but also that would be a reasonably straightforward thing to, to animate. So that we're seeing something that we don't have to apply a little bit more imagination to because it's it's convincingly real in the way that, that these things are in, in films and games. Yeah, I definitely. We're, I mean, we're, we're looking at um, a sort of a, a VR sort of um, type arrangement. Um, it's not it's not my area of expertise at all, really, but we are kind of just really interested in getting this these these concepts out in any way that helps to engage people. So. Um, yeah. University of Cumbria at, at Carlisle have got some expertise in that if you. Yeah. OK. So, yeah. We, well, we talked to Kane um, Scrimger, who's one of the uh, one of the lecturers at, at Carlisle. So I'll perhaps pick that up with him. Yeah. But yeah. Definitely yeah. And there'll be, there'll be people. Thank you, Andrew. There'll be people, you know, in this network, Lee, who would have lots of expertise in that sort of direction. Yeah. Chris Bridgman asks, are you in favour of walls coming back then, Lee? <laughs> I don't think it'll, I don't think it'll happen in this part of the world. Not in our not in our lifetime. I mean, ecologically, yes. Um, but I think it's a very, we've got a very long way to go before people would accept that. I think we might see it in Scotland. Um, and once they're there, then they, they may well spread. Um, there's no, they're in pretty well every other country in Europe, including places that are much more densely populated than we are. And they manage, seem to manage. So, you know, reason would suggest why not. But um, yeah, it's going to be hard work, I think. Up, uphill slog, slog that one. So I think plenty of other stuff to focus on before we get to there. OK, and last one for me before we go to Ben and the fantastic street art in Carlisle is Fliss, Fliss asks in chat, do you think people are so separated from nature that they need to be shown the difference between the green in, for example, a lawn and the green of a diverse ecosystem? Yeah, sadly so. Yeah, I think a lot of people see green and think it equals healthy, but actually the sort of the really green fields, the silage fields for, from a typical dairy farm are just deserts, you know. So, yeah, I think people do need to have that explained to them, sadly. OK, all right. Well, listen, that's been a fascinating half hour, Lee. Thank you so much for sharing your beautiful slides and reflections and answering those questions. Um, it's a half decent book, everybody. I commend it to you. It's in hardback at the moment. No doubt it's in libraries as well. And no doubt the paperback version will be around the corner sometime, probably April. just before Christmas or something like that. I don't no, know. No, it's April. It's ages. April, though. is it? OK, just before yeah. Easter then. Yeah, um, yeah. thanks, Tom. Uh, thank you so much, Lee. And, uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a thing that you're doing, which I think is making the world a better place, not without its bumps in the road, I'm sure. But I always admire people that basically are trying to make a bit of change happen for the better. So I think that's what you're doing amongst many other things and working for the RSPB as a day job too. So thanks for your time and uh, stay thanks. in touch. All right, yep, nice to we'll see do. you. Thank you, Lee. Thanks, thanks a lot. I'm gonna stick around for the next bit. Excellent, good. Well, I think you should, because Ben Heslop's a bit of a genius too. So Ben, I'm gonna hand over to you. Um, I've got the three little films lined up. So just tell me when you want to play them. If you'd like to introduce yourself, um, we've got about sort of 12 minutes or so um, to talk about what you're doing in Carlisle. Hi again, everyone, for those that have seen me before. Um, yeah, Tom kindly asked me to come and uh, chat about the latest incarnation of what we've been trying to achieve over the last, scarily, five years now. Um, so, Tom, would you like to play the first video and then we can add some context to it, I would say. And thank you, Lee, that was really interesting as someone who enjoys being in the lakes a lot and seeing the changes that are happening there. I think it's great to hear the, the backstory. Suspense. Um, while the video is coming up, I'll, I'll be quiet as soon as it, it does. Oh, there we go. I knew that would happen.
So that was uh, the first little trailer video um, that we, we did. Um, so basically we've been building up the street art trail as most people know, which now has, I think 16 pieces of art around the city. And I know I was here just after Timon had painted or Smug had painted last time. Um, and those last two pieces got voted second and third in the world in a worldwide vote. And just kind of increased the interest in what we were trying to build and why we were trying to push public art so much in in it in our form um in a place which had no tradition with it which isn't a new thing i don't claim to have pioneered that aberdeen have done it and other places around the world bruges has done it um but my main driving force from painting that first wall to where we're at today was this lack of engagement with a wider community with art and public art through placemaking and challenging people again it's in the nicest possible way, it's kind of irrelevant whether they like the art or not. I want them to engage with it. And yes, obviously we would rather they liked it. And like any gallery, we don't expect them to like all of it. My job is to curate a whole cross section of art for people to, to see. Um, but my main job is to challenge them by showing them a piece of art in a place they didn't expect it, on a scale they didn't expect it. And even if they think it's an absolute abomination and it's the worst thing, I'm fine with that because they have had an opinion, they have had a touch point with something that they were, wouldn't otherwise have behind a closed door. Thankfully, the response has been massively positive. Um, and the idea, um, even before Smug and Timon came, was to work towards this festival. As ever, it was the old funding issue of putting something together like this, which just looks like a few people painting, has quite a few zeros on the end of it. Um, but we were lucky enough for Cumbria County Council to share the, the vision of what we were doing uh, and some other private sponsors as well, and it has made it possible. Um, we're pulling it out the hat now, but it's obviously nearly a year of being in the trenches and, and, and trying to make it all happen with lots of barriers in the way. Um, we picked Tribe because we've worked with Tribe for a while and we want to give them as much of an uplift as possible. I really like what they're doing culturally in a different level for, for Carlisle um, from a small business and from an engagement and from a just putting things on perspective. Um, so we got this green space, which you saw in that video, which is next to where they are. And that is where we're, we're building the walls. Um, so Tom, if you would like to play the building the wall video. <laughs> Um, so that was Monday night, um, 18 seconds uh, wall build. Uh, so we're, um, we're basically have got planning permission to put up these semi-temporary walls um, for, for the next three years. Um, and they're five meters by two and a half meters. And then there's a couple of two and a half by two and a half meter canvases all on long lasting marine ply, which will be painted first and primed and then repainted and then obviously the artist will come and paint on on top of them so um they will be there post festival uh, as an open air gallery for people to either do the tour in the town and then link that on or just engage with it there um the nine artists are coming from all over europe and the uk um we have um we've got one artist who heard me speak at the university is doing illustration and fine art and came and said, how could I help? And I said, challenge yourself to paint really big. And she went, OK. And that's the kind of people we want to sort of engage with. So it was great to have a local context as well. And there's another local artist who has done a lot of small scale art, who is now painting two and a half by two and a half. And at the moment, nine days out, really regretting saying that they would do that. But they're, they're going to uh, they're going to get there. Um, and some of the best in the world as ever. We've been really fierce in who we bring all the time. 
because we don't have to settle for second best in Cumbria. But, and, and we get told it so many times in so many different sectors, oh, it's the Northwest, oh, it's, you know, it's up there, it's out there. And I grew up here and I felt that when bands released where they were playing and never came around our area and, and lots of events happened, you know, and, it, and it's, it's so much better now. Um, but I think it's our job to really keep pushing that. Um, and we've just been listed, um, no pressure on me here, before we've even done our first year of the festival as the top, one of the top five street art events in the world to see in June. And I'm busy like putting, putting walls up. And that's back on, uh, on what, we've, what we've achieved so far and the list of people that they know who's coming. And, and that's really good affirmation for me, but also for everyone who's invested time, energy or finance in what we've, we've tried to achieve here, because you know it, it does matter and it does show up, whether it's from a tourism point of view, we have people traveling from apart, not outside of the artists. We've already been contacted by lots of people. Uh, we've got people traveling up from London, Brighton, down from Glasgow, uh, one couple from France. Um, and although that's like four test cases, they're all booking hotels. They're all going to eat out. They're all going to spend. They're all going to know a bit more about Carlisle, maybe go to Tully House, maybe see another arts event. And it's just creating that platform where we are expanding uh, the offer. Um, in our own specific way, we're using street art and public art to do it. But I just think it, it broadens the, the landscape of culture and, and offerings in Cumbria. Um, we're very excited about it. Uh, we, we can't control the weather. All the controllables are being controlled. Um, we'd love uh, to see as many people come down uh, and, and see how it works. A street art festival is a new concept for this area, but it's one that I'm lucky enough to have been to lots all over the world. Um, Basically, the artists kind of arrive over that week, depending on their style or the size of the wall they're doing. Um, and they will be creating on site mainly some Tuesday, but mainly Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, with the aim of finishing on Saturday and Sunday. Um, so people, it's really important that people come and engage with the process as well. Part of what we do is great to have um, that kind of pop up of, oh, wow, that's just appeared. But it's also great for people to see how all these processes work because they all work differently, just like all oh, you lot will work differently in your own practices. Uh, and it's always really interesting to kind of look under the bonnet uh, and then see see how it's created. With, with any, we're not, we've not just got spray can artists this time, we've got um, brush uh, and freehand artists as well. But the, the big thing about the spray paint, when people see the finished detail and then you tell them, you realize he hasn't even touched the wall everything has been sprayed from sort of three mil to one foot away. And then they kind of have a different viewpoint of like how that has been created. Um, and again, it's just the number of people who have gone past us while we're building the wall and saying, what's that? I don't know anything about it. And then being like, wow, that, that's amazing. I want to come and see it. That, that's kind of what we're about. So uh, that's a brief over, overview of, of what we're up to now and that, how it fits in with what we have done and what we're like to do. Hopefully it's gonna be a yearly thing uh, and we should continue to bring more artists in to, to repaint and expand what we're doing. But thank you as always for your time. And it would be lovely to see some of you down there. Needless to say, I will be on site all week. So if you see me looking around, hopefully smiling and the sun will be kind of out or at least it'll be dry, come and say hello. Ben, thank you. As someone who's just been decorating a couple of walls in my house, uh, I appreciate the skill that goes into painting walls in an artistic way. Uh, Vegas is saying, I love looking at, I hope I was going to pronounce this right, Timon de Liet's two pieces in Carlisle, one at the fire station and the other opposite Sainsbury's uh, near, the, um, near the biscuit factory. Um, and, uh, and do you want to, Ben, just give us 30 seconds on what is Tribe for those people that aren't that familiar with Carlisle or what is Tribe? Um, Tribe, uh, we're not linked with Tribe but in any way apart from uh, we're putting the, the festival on there. It's a mini box park, so where they put the containers sort of down for startup businesses, small emergent businesses to try test or become flourishing. So it has basically like a bar, um, a few food places, but it also has exhibition space. So it's had, um, oh, I'm going to really miss a load of important stuff that's happened there. It's just done a Black, Black Memories Matter sort of... Um, month in in one of the containers it's done a sort of youth engagement area it's like a bookable area which anyone can use and the owner is really pushing 
cultural events and um, while it does have a business side to it, um, it's, it's very much focused on bringing arts, creativity and culture to uh, a small part of uh, Fitz Park. Great. OK, so it's a great location for this sort of thing. Um, the weather was set fair, I'm sure, Ben. It's, we'll see the clouds and make sure it's nice and dry and sunny for you at all times. Um, good luck with that. I think just give us the dates again. Is it the 22nd of June? 22nd is the Wednesday till the 26th, which is, which is the Sunday. Most artists are painting them. Some will be arriving uh, Tuesday. Um, okay. but yeah. Great. Great stuff. Good luck with it. And well done on your, all the energy. You'll be the man with the bags under your eyes for most of that weekend, probably. But uh, good luck yeah. with it all. OK, it's 25 past 10. Just I'm just going to fill you in on a couple of things. Uh, next week, um, we're going to be doing a bit sort of conceptual meeting. So where do ideas come from? I'm just gathering together two or three people who are who are idea makers. If you think you're one of those, you know, where do creative ideas actually come from? What stimulates creativity? Whatever art form it is that you work, where on earth do you get your ideas from? So we're going to look at that um, with a bit of a depth next week um, with a view to maybe not coming up with many answers, but hopefully it'll be an interesting discussion and it might stimulate you to think a bit differently as well. So if you're interested in where, where do ideas come from, where do they originate from, um, please do come along next Friday. Lee, one or two people saying, would you mind putting your contact details into chat so that they can um, carry on, pick up with you after the meeting? So if you want to do that, please pop your contact details, Lee, into chat. Is that all right? I've done that. Great, thank you. Um, and June the 24th, which is two weeks from now, we're going to do our next quarterly meeting. We're going to do it on Zoom and we're going to be looking at inc inclusivity and diversity in the arts and culture in Cumbria. So this is one of the four investment principles of the Arts Council, as those of you that have either engaged in MPO applications or project grant application of the Arts Council, you'll be familiar with Let's Create, which is their new strategy, and the four investment principles that are driving it. One of them is all about inclusivity and diversity. So if you are applying for stuff, it's worth thinking about how you apply for it, as well as we can have a we can have a conversation and a discussion about what do we actually mean by inclusivity and diversity. So we're going to be looking at that in two weeks' time. I'm lining up some really interesting people to talk about that, and everybody is welcome to that meeting. Um, Prism Arts are running a symposium the following week uh, in com in connection with the University of Cumbria, looking at this in depth. So as a sort of precursor to that, I'm talking with Jane Dubman from Prism Arts, who's going to kick off the session with us on the 24th. So inclusivity and diversity, look out for details about that. A, it's a really interesting topic and, a, and a, an important topic to talk about, but B, um, there might be some, some mileage in thinking about how that might help you apply for money from the Arts Council. And by the way, in September, we're going to do a part two to this meeting, and it's such a sort of big topic, and that will be face-to-face -face at Rose Hill, probably on the 17th of September. Um, so we're going to look at, look at diversity and inclusion. We're going to kick it off on the 24th of June and get back together, hopefully with someone from the Arts Council, um, on the 17th of September at... Um, Rose Hill. So that is the plan for the next two weeks. In the meantime, we of course have a great Facebook group, about 1,100 people are part of that group now, uh, a vibrant Twitter account and um, Instagram account as well. So good, good way of sharing stuff, promoting stuff, finding out about stuff that's going on. Um, so do get, engage with those as well. Thank you very much to Lee and to Ben for your great work. Uh, good luck with all the ongoing work that, that accompanies that as well. Um, you've got massive backing and support from everybody at this meeting um, to, to continue to do what you're doing. Um, that's not doesn't mean to say we don't question, we don't discuss, we can disagree about stuff too. But um, sustainability and carbon zero was one of the things that's come out of our um, quarterly meetings last year. So I'm, I'm determined to continue that conversation and finding people like Lee to help provoke thoughts about that is a, is a good thing to do, I think. So we'll continue to do that too. Thanks, thanks for coming, everybody. If you were new here, you're very welcome to come back again. Have a great weekend. It's 10.28. We've all gained two minutes as well. See you all again soon. Bye-bye.